Hello, my name is David Wu. Have you wondered why we're seeing increasing violence as well as a wider gap between the haves and the have-nots? For the last 30 years, I have been developing a framework called Moral Innovations that can help us understand these concepts. I'll be presenting this uh, Moral Innovations concept in two slides or two episodes. The first episode, I'll explain the uh, concepts and also how we got to where we are today. I'll begin with explaining uh, and defining knowledge, followed by defining golden rule. And then I know that uh, many of us believe in creation and many of us believe in the Big Bang. However, we do not know who created God, nor do we know what happened before the Big Bang. So we'll be focusing on the last 2,000 years in our presentation. This is our definition of knowledge. If you look at the blue circle, it is beliefs, which reflect your faith, uh, your gut feel, uh, your perception, um, and it relies on trust uh, that the, the beliefs are there. Even though the red circle says the truth, uh, it is not an absolute truth, uh, it reflects on phenomena that we think uh, on a consistent basis will give us reasonable assurance that um, uh, we can deliver consistent results. What we want to pursue is confirmed beliefs in the form of truths in order for us to define knowledge. What we want to pursue is the yellow circle in knowledge here. What do we mean by the golden rule? I will go through this and say that the Christians believe in one God and they are monotheists and these are the sayings in the Bible. Muslims also believe in one God, they are also monotheists. These are the expressions in the Quran as well as the sayings of uh, uh, writings of the Muhammad. Zoroastrians started in Persia and uh, which is today's uh, Iran, and they developed the concept of heaven and hell, among other things that were accepted and adopted by other religions. So this is their golden rule. We know that the 2,500 years ago, 2,500 uh, years ago, um, there were hundreds of schools of thought uh, in China, including uh, Yi Qing, Lao Tzu. But 2,000 years ago, Confucius was defined as the mainstream and therefore the Analects are reflected in here. In India, they have a single God for specific circumstances and it's perfectly okay for gods to exist uh, uh, in other circumstances. This by definition is henotheism. And Buddhism is also presented here because uh, even though uh, Buddha was born in Nepal, uh, because it is uh, widespread in India, Southeast Asia, as well as China. This world map has a lot of information. I would just pick on uh, some highlights for you. The red region here are occupy our uh, uh, Christian world. The green is the Muslim world. India is beige and China is gray. The four asterisks are the four ancient civilizations 5,000 years ago and this one, the far left, is Egypt. This one is Sumer. This is India, and this is China. You will notice that they are roughly equal distance away from the equator, which implies that the climate has something to do with when they settled. And they had plenty of room to explore 5,000 years ago. Today, the red, the green, and uh, 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 the Indians and the Chinese represent 95% of humanity. In the last slide, we looked at humans in this slide, we're looking at economics. Be careful about the scale here because years 1 to 1820 or 1800 years is in the first third of this, uh, of this chart, and the last 200 years is in the two-thirds of the chart. What this tells you is that between the year 1 and year 1800, China and India represented over 50% of the global domestic product in the world. In other words, China and India were much bigger than Egypt and Roman empires that we have studied in school. In fact, in 1820, uh, China represented 35% of the global domestic product uh, and one third of the world's goods and services were produced in China. But in this red box, 
China's share of the global domestic product went from 35% to 5%. We don't really talk about that enough, but what we have been focusing on in the, in the last 40 years, China's growth in the green box went from 5% to about 18%, knowing that even at 18%, they're only about a half of what they had 200 years ago. What happened is the natural question. The two events that changed the world, they both start with OP. The first one is the Opium War that, the started, that was in the 19th century. And the second one is the OPEC oil, and it's still happening today. In the Opium War, an average $1 trillion a year was taken from China for over 100 years. And that includes 70,000 tons of silver, along with countless uh, uh, historic artifacts. And Ch China went from the wealthiest nation on earth to bankruptcy around the year 1900. In OPEC oil, uh, we actually are transferring roughly $2 trillion a year from the poor to the rich. And that is the foundation why we are transferring wealth and creating the wealth gap that includes ourselves in this uh, uh, wealth gap. And we'll go through that uh, in more detail. Please also consider the small print in here that talks about the U.S. subprime housing bubble between 2004 and 2008. In those five years, approximately $5 trillion was lost, which roughly translates into $1 trillion a year, like the opium war, except the bubble was only five years. So if you multiply that by 20, you can imagine what the impact is for the opium war. No, no matter what happens, both events clearly violated the golden rule. When we look at the opium war, we typically see this. The British refused to stop trading it, and it led to the opium war. The Chinese lose, they got Hong Kong, and, and that's basically a general overview of the opium wars. In fact, if you look at the annual consumption of opium in metric tons from 1800 to 2016, 1800 here and 2016 here, and zero metric tons here and 50,000 tons of metric tons here, the opium wars happened between 1838 and 1858. So this is the volume of opium that was introduced during the opium war, and a much, much larger consumption happened after the opium war. If I look at the each annual consumption uh, of metric, by metric ton of opium in between the opium war and the beginning of the 20th century, an estimated one million tons of opium in 80 years destroyed China. Next, we'll take a look at the uh, oil price. Uh, this is a chart from 1960 to, to today of the per barrel oil price, which went from about $30 a barrel to $160 a barrel. And you can see that before 1973-74, oil was already giving them a nice profit. And the blue region here is the rough cost of production for oil. So this area underneath the blue line is the profit. So before 1974, there was already a pretty healthy profit to be made. And look at this uh, price. And Every single uh, region underneath this chart is profit to the OPEC and oil producers. And it's also interesting to note that the last time the USA government delivered a budget surplus was when the oil price was uh, at this, uh, roughly about 20 to $30 a barrel. We, after we look at the per barrel concept of profit, now we look at the cumulative production uh, and the OPEC oil share. From 1960 to 2013, the global production of oil increased from 20 million uh, tons uh, a day, uh, barrels a day, to 80 million barrels a day. And the blue line here is the OPEC share, which roughly is approximately 45% on average in those 40 years. And what happened to the wealth gap? The wealth gap widened in 2018 alone by $1.6 trillion. And how did I get that number? It's roughly 80 million barrels a day times 365 days a year, $65 price from the last chart, and $10 cost. If you multiply 55 plus 365 plus 80 million, you will come up with 1.6 trillion.
So what, is, what are the driving forces behind these two events? The two drivers are the Torricellos and Zaragoza treaties that were signed in 1494 and 1529. And the Britain participated uh, after 1588, and then we needed slaves in order to um, uh, industrialize the world. This is a world map uh, underneath uh, Torricellos and Zaragoza Treaty. The green region of the world belongs to Spain, and the Burgundy belongs to Portugal, even though half the world already lives in uh, Asia. In 1588, um, the Spanish did not like the fact that the British were uh, using pirates to rob the treasures that were heading towards Spain. So they sent 130 ships to try to defeat Britain, and they were defeated, and the British ships chased them back to Spain, which emboldened the British. And instead of just trying to be pirates, they decided to pursue wealth around the world by incorporating the British East India Company in 1600, which is 12 years after they defeated the Spanish Armada. And as the world industrialized, they need slaves. And this is a picture in the 18th century for about 100 years, about 6 million slaves left Africa to the Americas. And you can see that only a small portion of this went to uh, the United States. And the African population as a whole continent did not change at all in 200 years when the rest of the population more than doubled. In 1776, the United States uh, became a nation and started to uh, uh, industrialize. Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, which is right here, and they needed slaves in order to uh, make this profitable. And uh, what happened uh, uh, if the, uh, uh, what happened to China as uh, U.S. industrialized? Um, we will look at the impact on the uh, two treaties that led to rapid industrialization without morality. Um, the world was focused on the wealth in China from the Silk Road trades, and they used gunboats. And the missionaries translated the uh, Nanjing Treaty. So they knew that, uh, number one, uh, their intellectual properties and their rights and traditions were not followed. And therefore, they see how uh, things can be taken away from China. And then in, in the last 40 years, they focused on growth with cheap labor and did not focus on the environment. Looking at the emissions by world region between 1850 and 2010, you can see that Asia, this red region, uh, roughly uh, 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 quadrupled uh, the emissions of sulfur dioxide, and Europe and the Americas reduced the emissions during this period of time. So China sacrificed the environment. And not surprisingly, the air quality in China and India are the worst in the world today. And it's interesting to note that the, the regions under uh, Muslim rule is also have bad uh, air quality. We have to know the impacts of the, these drivers in India. And India is more complex because, for example, how do we explain to the Indians that the, in 1661, Bombay was given to the British as part of the Portuguese princess, Catherine, of, uh, as a dowry to England. But India is among the truest form of democracy in the world today, and they will re-emerge as a strong democracy. We have been talking about humanity for the last couple hundred years, and you can see that the, we reached one billion, year, one billion people in 1800, and we'll be reaching 10 billion people, or adding two more billion people within this century. In episode two, we'll discuss what we'll do to humanity to achieve uh, and sustain harmony. Uh, and we'll try to change the course of the increased uh, violence and, um, um, and widening of the, uh, of the wealth gap. Stay tuned for episode two.